Hello and welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Space News Roundup. This for the week of the 23rd to 29th of August, 2021. I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by my co-host Jean Deville. And before getting into this week's news updates, a couple of quick shout outs to our good friends at GoTikonauts and Spacewatch.Global, two excellent sources of space industry news. Also a reminder that if you have not done so already, I recommend you sign up for our Dongfang Hour newsletter for a lot more news updates every week. This week on the show, we bring you updates on a one kilometer long space station, a few launches during the week, but first, some discussion on a turbulent week in U.S.-China space relations. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. John, what's going on with U.S.-China? Yes, turbulent uh, week for both countries. Um, some context here. The past week, we saw the 36th Space Symposium take place in Colorado Springs. So that's in the state of Colorado in the U.S. And more specifically, on the 25th of August, there was um, this panel that took place with the head of space agencies in which we saw NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. And the discussion was mostly about the ISS. But during this discussion, Bill Nelson voiced a strong skepticism about any collaboration with China. And notably, when they were talking about the ISS and, and the human presence in LEO, basically, Nelson mentioned that he hoped to see um, the ISS prolonged at least until the 2030s, and he hoped that commercial initiatives would um, replace the ISS after that. And China inevitably came up during the discussion as the country is also currently um, assembling the only other operational space station, the Tiangong Space Station. And Nelson put aside any idea of cooperation with China due to a lack of transparency with his exact words being. Unfortunately, I believe we're in a space race with China. I'm speaking on the behalf of the United States for China to be a partner. I'd like China to do with us as a military adversary like Russia has done. I would like to try and do that. But China is very secretive and part of a civilian space program is that you've got to be transparent. End of quote. And this quote isn't without reminding us of another sequence in May 2021 where Nelson was testifying in front of a White House committee. And this was just after China had landed the Jurong rover on Mars. And during the sequence, we saw Nelson brandish a picture basically of the Jurong rover that CNSA had released a couple of days earlier. And he said, I think that's adding a new element as to whether or not we want to get serious and get a lot of activity going and landing humans back on the surface of the moon. So again, putting forward this sort of space race atmosphere between the U.S. and China. So back to the statement from Nelson in Colorado Springs, it was met with deep skepticism um, in China on the Chinese Internet and a lot of Chinese netizens pointing out that the literal non-existent uh, state currently of the U.S.-China space relation is due to U.S. Um, export restrictions. It's also due to regulations like the Wolf Amendment since 2011 that basically prohibits NASA from having any direct contact with um, their Chinese counterparts. So, um, so yeah, definitely some tensions. And taking a step back here, the tension here on the U.S. side is not entirely unexpected because if the ISS funding um, and lifespan is not extended by the U.S. Congress or by ISS um, uh, partner nations, and, and if, you know, commercial space station initiatives fail to materialize in a near future, then potentially the Chinese space station could be the only operational space station in low Earth orbit in, you know, in a couple of years. And you add to that, that European nations and Russia have been invited on board the Chinese space station, and that China is also having closer and closer ties with Russia regarding lunar exploration, and namely it's the ILRS, the International Lunar Research Station. Well, you can see how um, China is increasingly shaping the landscape of crewed space flight and um, potentially at the expense of the U.S. So probably this is where the tension is coming from. And so I think we'll have to see how this goes in, in coming years, but I don't think things will change much and these tensions will remain. We've seen that the new U.S. administration has shown no sign of wanting to take a softer stance on the uh, on China affairs, maybe regarding space or non-space stuff. 
Definitely. That would be an interesting future to be at a point where the only operational LEO space station was the Chinese space station, although we'll have to see. Um, so just a couple of points on the Chinese response to the above panel discussion and the ongoings in Colorado more generally. Um, so the first point I would bring up is that we saw the topic of the space symposium come up at a press conference on August 25th, halfway around the world in Beijing uh, with foreign ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin. And the press conference was being held on the National Low Carbon Day and also during the 31st National Energy Conservation Week. So a lot of discussion was around renewables and a sustainable future, uh, but also included a few questions about space-related topics and in particular the events in Colorado Springs. So there was a reporter from Shenzhen TV that highlighted comments made by U.S. Uh, Space Command Head General James Dickinson during his speech in Colorado where uh, they pointed out in particular um, that Dickinson noted U.S. space warfighting capabilities are increasing and that there would be conducting military exercises in space in the coming years. So perhaps not uh, so ag aggressive, but quite forceful about uh, what the U.S. is up to. And so again, at this press conference, a uh, foreign ministry spokesperson Wang uh, responded to this saying, I quote, space security is getting increasingly complicated and severe with the U.S. being the primary factor that has an impact on space security. In recent years, the U.S. has openly defined space as a new warfighting domain, put in place an independent space force and space command, and vigorously built up military strength. What the U.S. has done exacerbates the risks of weaponizing space and turning it into a warfighting domain and severely threatens the peace and tranquility in space. In this regard, China is deeply concerned. So definitely some, uh, some pretty clear words there and uh, some interesting developments in the U.S.-China space relations over the past week. Um, and it's fascinating that an event such as the Space Symposium in a place like Colorado Springs can become such a flashpoint for the relationship between these two countries. And last point I would bring up on U.S.-China space specifically, if you're interested in more information about it, we did a long-form episode in April of 2021 where we interviewed with the Secure World Foundation and the Kalis Foundation. So we'll put a link on the screen, and if you're interested in more, recommend checking that out. So going back to the conference and just a couple of final points to wrap up, um, I think it's very interesting to see that this conference actually took place. It was probably the largest space industry conference in the U.S. since Satellite 2020 in March of 2020, which was basically right at the beginning of the COVID outbreak in the U.S. And a couple of the people that I had spoken with who attended the conference said that the attendance was better than they would have expected and that it was very refreshing to be at an in-person conference. So again, pretty cool to see. Um, the symposium itself, just a little bit of background, it's a pretty interesting event. It brings together a lot of people from military space and an increasing number of commercial space companies that are hoping to do business with you know, the U.S. military or NASA. And so, again, from reports on the ground, we heard there was a very large exhibition hall with booths for all of the usual suspects, so Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, etc. Um, and then another massive exhibition hall with a large number of commercial space companies. So overall, sounds like a pretty cool conference, even if it did become kind of a flashpoint. Just a couple of other noteworthy pieces of information to come from the conference, and then I'll turn it back over to Jean for some launch updates. Um, so the conference included a discussion on the shortage of global semiconductors and the extent to which that is impacting the U.S. military and their LEO broadband plans. So notably, the U.S. military had planned to launch 12 DARPA LEO comm satellites in 2022 as part of their blackjack program, um, and these may be impacted because of semiconductor supply shortages. And the last point is that uh, we heard from Gwyn Shotwell, the president of SpaceX, that the Starlink constellation is going to have laser intersatellite link terminals on all future satellites, which is apparently the reason for a current lull in Starlink launch cadence. And so Shotwell mentioned that the biggest pain points from a cost perspective for them right now has been the user terminal, which is, uh, I, as far as we know, around 2000 or 2500 US dollars to manufacture, but it's sold for around 500 and so, again, this is an overlooked piece of the puzzle in terms of LEO constellations and uh, something that Shotwell highlighted as the biggest bottleneck. Uh, so, John, anything else from your side on uh, Starlink or U.S. China or Colorado Springs, or shall we move into the launch updates? I'm good. Let's move on to launch. There were two launch updates that are worth mentioning this week. The first one was on uh, August the 24th. It was a Tuesday, a Long March 2C uh, launched three telecommunication satellites. And Although limited information was available about the launch, we know that um, two of the main payloads appeared to be uh, the Ronghe test satellite 1 and 2, or Ronghe Shiyan Weixing in Chinese. And also, there was a third satellite, uh, which was a different type of telecommunications test satellite. And all three satellites were manufactured by CAST. We don't know that much about these payloads, but there are some theories. And a common theory among space observers is that these two 
Ronghe satellites are technology verification satellites in the context of China wanting to build up its own broadband mega constellation. Several hints here. For one, the Long March 2C uses for the second time only the Yuan Zheng 1S, which is a liquid fueled restartable upper stage and which was designed specifically for the Long March 2C and significantly boosts its payload capacity. And one of the other hints is that this Long March 2C used for the very first time a new 4.2 diameter fairing with um, you know, a central tube shaped multi satellite adapter structure, which enables the rocket to carry up to 20 satellites. So 20 satellites is sort of Hints at, um, again, the deployment uh, possibly of a constellation. And on a side note here, there's another rocket that's coming up in the coming months, um, basically with a maiden launch in 2022, and also has a payload capacity of 20-ish satellites, potentially. That's uh, the Jelong 3, which is a rocket, a solid field rocket that's currently under development at the China Rocket, which is a commercial subsidiary of CALT, the Chinese Academy of Launch Technology. So all this could be signs that we're getting closer to a deployment of the Guowang constellation, which is also known as China's response to Starlink. Um, the second launch of the week also that took place on August the 24th, I think with a difference of a couple of hours only, China launched a Long March 3B carrying a communication technology verification satellite number seven or Tongxin Jishu Shi Yan Weixing Qi Hao designed by SAS, so the Shanghai Academy of Space Technology. And the Long March 3B is China's geostationary orbit, um, you know, workhorse launch vehicle. It's been around since the late 1990s. So it's rather based on older rocket technology, but China has been incrementally improving its older rockets at the same time working on new rockets. And so we know that Long March 3B, for example, here had some improvements for this flight, notably three. Uh, first one is optimization of the pre-cooling sequence. I'm not sure what this refers to. Second improvement was the improvement of the impeller blade production. And third one was new materials for the auxiliary control valve rod for increased reliability. Unfortunately, not much more is known about this launch or this payload. So I'll just leave it there. Um, for Blaine, do you have any other comments on any of these two launches? That auxiliary control valve rod, it's good to hear that they have some new materials for that. Uh, just really engineering -y stuff. So just a very small point to add on the second launch. So with regard to the comms technology verification satellite number seven that Jean just mentioned, I would point out that the two previous satellites in this series, so namely numbers five and six, uh, launched in early 2020 and early 2021, respectively, both of them to GEO. And we understand that the five satellite launched in early 2021 was allegedly using some, uh, trying to prove some advanced HTS technologies, uh, so high throughput satellite technologies, uh, which would enable China presumably to make larger communication satellites. So uh, nothing else on those two launches, but moving into another launch update, which actually took place uh, last weekend at the very end of the week, uh, we saw an announcement from XSpace that the company's Quadro 1A rocket would be returning to flight next month with two launches planned. So just a little bit of background on the Quadro 1A, it is a commercial rocket that is most probably the most successful commercial rocket in China to date. So they had carried 19 satellites into orbit on the first nine, uh, nine launches, all of which were successful, um, leading up to September 2020. And at that time, they had a launch failure in their 10th attempt of the Quadro 1A, this coming just a couple of months after another launch failure of the Quadro 11, which was their medium-sized rocket that took place a little bit earlier in 2020. And so the Quadro 1A is a solid fueled rocket with capabilities of being launched from a transporter erector launcher or TEL. Um, and the rocket was designed to be a pretty rapid response launch vehicle. And again, it has become one of several rockets favored by China's commercial satellite manufacturers and operators. It was also the rocket that was auctioned live online uh, in April of last year, which was pretty cool to see. Um, so in the year since the failure, we've had very limited updates from XSpace. We have not really heard very much from them. The announcement last week that the rockets had been assembled and were nearly ready for launch is certainly a good sign, um, and it may bring some relief to the launch bottleneck that is currently faced by commercial satellite manufacturers. And as discussed on previous episodes, most CASC launches are already mostly occupied with uh, government missions, and so really there's not a lot of space available on these cask launches. And so these medium, uh, small to medium size, fast response, high launch cadence rockets, such as the Quadro 1A, are definitely going to be an important component of the sort of uh, the progressive evolution of Chinese commercial space. And so one last point in regard to this specific announcement is that the first rocket set to be launched next month is known as the Xinzhou or the Xinzhou Hao, uh, which is named after the district in Wuhan where XSpace's parent company, the Sanjiang Corporation, has its operations. 
And so in this article, the Sanjiang Corporation and the district government noted that the rocket represents a new chapter in the cooperation between the company and the district. And it's another example, I think, of the uh, the interplay between the diverse variety of stakeholders in Chinese commercial space. So in this particular situation, a pure state-owned company in Sanjiang, a state-owned uh, commercial spin-off in X-Space, and a district-level government in the city of Wuhan all working together to uh, to build cool rockets. So that's all from my side on the rocket update. Uh, Jean, I believe we have a one-kilometer-long space station to discuss as well. Absolutely. There's a lot of uh, talk about this this week. We've been hearing some stuff of China laying the groundwork for a one-kilometer-long space station. And just to put this one kilometer into perspective... Um, the order of magnitude of the size of the ISS is maybe 100-ish meters for the uh, Tianhe core module of the Chinese space station. We're talking about 20-ish meters. Um, and here we're talking about one kilometer. So this is several orders of magnitude above. And um, getting into the facts here about this project. So early in August, we saw the China's Natural Science Foundation, the Guojiazi然科学基金委员会, they published a document called Guidelines for the 14th Five-Year Plan, First Batch of Projects, which basically lists and offers grants for specific um, projects that are considered priority projects and which were subdivided into categories. And among the mathematical sciences category was this very interesting preliminary research project called Study of the Dynamics and the Control of a Super Large Space Structure Assembly. Now, obviously, from the phrasing of this um, research project, you can feel that this is very early stage research rather than, than an actual engineering project that's on China's roadmap. And so the announcements of China actually building a one kilometer uh, long space station obviously is false. We're talking about fundamental research here. The purpose of the space station would be, so quoting them here, to enable long term stays in space space resources utilization, extending the current space station and advancing space exploration and space sciences. And four research topics were um, discussed in this document. So there was a uh, first one, weight reducing strategies in the design of super large stations um, and probably no surprises there. Such a large station, the idea would be to try and control maybe through new materials, a way to, um, you know, avoid the station weight just getting totally out of control. The second research topic was dynamics of the assembly of a super large station. Again, no surprises there. Space stations, even smaller ones, it's weird to call the ISS smaller, but you know, space stations like the ISS, even um, they are assembled in multiple modules and not just all launched in one go. Third research direction, orbital and attitude control for a super large station, no surprises. And four ground simulation for the assembly of a super large, rock, uh, super large space station. Now, taking a step back here, if this space station ever materializes, as mentioned, this would probably be done through dozens and dozens of launches of China's future super heavy rocket, the Long March 9. And this such a massive concept does remind us a little bit of this speech from Long Le Hao in June 2021. So Long Le Hao, the chief designer of China's Long March rockets, where he discussed a gigawatt level um, Chinese space-based solar station plan for the 2050s, and that would have the size of several kilometers that would weigh 10,000 tons and necessitate 140-ish Long March 9 launches to be deployed. And so, you know, we're getting close again to this kilometer long space station idea. Another Similar discussion was from the president of CALT, Wang Xiaojun. This was in June 2021 at the GLEX conference and where he discussed a preliminary study for short-term and regular human exploration of Mars and which included spacecraft with several hundreds and possibly thousands of tons. So again, this idea of having this massive spacecraft that's assembled in orbit. These projects, again, they're very early stage. They're not really engineering projects on the roadmap, but it's cool to see that, you know, China is preparing you know, the technology building blocks for this. And um, hopefully we'll see this sort of stuff, um, you know, maybe in the decades to come, I'll probably have white hair by then, but um, it will still be cool to see. And we'll probably still be doing the Dongfang Hour. And indeed, it brings us one <laughs> step closer to like 2001, A Space Odyssey, where you have a Hilton Hotel, if I'm not wrong, up in space. That's uh, what a concept. Um, so nothing else from my side on these, you know, mega projects, but, um, just a reminder. So this has been another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Space News Roundup for the week of the 23rd to 29th of August, 2021. And for a bunch more insights on the news of this week, we encourage you to check out our Dongfang Hour newsletter at newsletter.dongfanghour.com. That is newsletter.dongfanghour.com. 
And if you like what you've uh, watched today, feel free to comment or share or like or otherwise uh, subscribe to our channel. We're always happy to hear from you. And if you've enjoyed this video and you want to support us, we're setting up an online donation box in the coming weeks. So feel free to do a contribution. It really helps the channel. And also, if you're a company, we also do some occasional consulting work. So do get in touch with us at contact at dongfonghour.com. And apart from that, I'm Jean Deville for the Dongfang Hour. Thank you very much for watching. And we'll see you in next week's episode. See you next week.